scrub hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Mm, no need for pesticides to poison all our soil. Before we start today's program, i like to give my joint host, Kelly Kristen from KDK Distributors, a chance to speak because Kelly likes to give away free vaporizers, don't you, Kelly? Well, let's face it, Casper, you and I have both been around long enough to see a lot of medical patients, and the vast majority of the medical patients simply cannot afford much. They're on assisted income, a disability pension, welfare, um, assisted income for the severely handicapped. It depends on where you are and what the programs are. But these, let's face it, these people have trouble with the money they receive in a month just to be able to afford rent and food. And then, of course, they have to buy their medicine. And uh, and then to try and afford a, a quality vaporizer, it just isn't in their grasp. So these are the people we're looking for. Um, I know that you're out there, and uh, and if you're listening to this, we do give away a free vaporizer once a month. Uh, it's very simple. Just send me an email to Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at kdkwholesale.ca, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll throw you in our small barrel, and uh, hopefully we draw your name and uh, send you a free vaporizer. Shipping included, we, we deliver it right to your door. Well, that is a, an act of love on behalf of you and your team, Kelly, and the marijuana movement I know truly benefits from that because, as you pointed out, it's healthier, and it certainly helps the patient make their medicine last longer, and there's other benefits for it as well. I know the first time I tried a vaporizer, I actually tasted what I smelled, you know how like when you smell chocolate, you bite the chocolate and it tastes like chocolate or you smell rose once in a while when somebody uses rose and you bite into a bacala or something and you go, oh, there's rose in this. Well, I've always wondered over the years when I smelt train wreck or smelt skunk, I wonder what this would taste like. Well, you can certainly taste the aroma, can't you? It's amazing uh, the difference. Uh, of course, with vaporization, depending on the temperature that you're using to start, um, you will, uh, on the very first bag that you vaporize your wonderful herb with, uh, the flavor and taste is amazing. Like you say, it's, it's literally like tasting what you can smell. Um, of course, each successive bag reduces in flavor. And, uh, of course, once you get up to the higher temperatures and that kind of stuff, yes, it starts to lose its flavor. But certainly in the beginning, you get that wonderful flavor. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's extremely nice. Kelly, before we go off to the music, you want to let people know one more time how they can get a free vaporizer? You bet. Send me an email, kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at K-D-K, wholesale, dot C-A. And uh, remember, everybody out there who's listening, please share this with your friends and know that the next time you hear me, you'll know that it's time for hemp. An acre of hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Mm, no need for pesticides to poison all our soil. People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. Thank you for taking Time for Hemp. I am your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to Time for Hemp on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and any place on the internet that you can find sound, you will find Time for Hemp. It is Tuesday, and on Tuesday we put a spotlight on all the amazing activists that are making a difference up in Canada with my joint host, Kelly Kristen. How are you doing today? Pretty groovy. We got an exciting guest. We always have good guests on, but this gentleman, I tell you, he is the epitome of the HEP movement. He writes books. He gets involved with organizations. He gets involved with events. He is, to me, just the perfect example of a hardworking activist. Awesome. And who is our guest today? Dana Larson. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. But it's true. <laughs> I mean, you really are. If I had to say, give you a perfect example of a hardworking activist who's doing what they can to educate the world around them about the need to end marijuana prohibition and reintroduce hemp 
back into the farm community, I would say, go study Dana Larson's last 15 years of living. I'm going to say you missed one. I think he's quite politically active as well. There you go. I, I'm proud to have been involved in the pop movement for the last 20 years and accomplished. And so uh, I appreciate all your wonderful comments there. It's, it's nice to be recognized. Absolutely. You're definitely uh, well-known within the movement, of course. Anybody who is involved in the movement in Canada certainly is aware of you. And I, I know that the people of Vancouver are more than aware of you because of your political involvement. And, and like you say, with the 420 events and uh, just basically everything that's going on there, it's obviously a very big part of your life. Well, and there's exciting times in Vancouver, Canada here. We've got so much going on. There's the uh, highs that are operating in the city, and they're, they're talking about giving us business licenses and also talking about trying to shut a bunch of these places down while they give the rest of us business licenses. So that's uh, an exciting and challenging time right now for all the dispensaries in the city. And uh, there's so much going on in Vancouver. It's, uh, it's, it's very exciting these days. Well, of course, with what uh, with the new government in place and who knows what's to come, hopefully we're only going to get better. Uh, I, I, I truly believe that Vancouver has been the cannabis capital of Canada for quite some time. Um, a lot going on there, a lot of involvement out there, um, much more forward thinking than the, than the rest of us, certainly here in Alberta, where we don't have anything on the go. There's no coffee shops there's no vape lounges there's no dispensaries there's nothing so um, we're much more looking forward i think than the rest of you because you've already sort of surpassed us more than a decade ago uh, you're ahead of us uh, out there and um, i'm i'm sure that it's due to the hard work of you and all of the people around you and so many people in vancouver are very involved and that's uh well we have yeah we we've, we've changed vancouver quite a bit over the years vancouver a, a cannabis and drug kind of city in some ways because we're a port city and and so there's always that coming and going but we've also definitely transformed this city over the last decades through activism and civil disobedience uh you know when, when we first started this 20 years ago you couldn't buy a bong or a pipe in vancouver and now there's not only head shops and vapor lounges, but dispensaries uh, and everything all over the place. So the city's definitely changed a lot in its attitude over the years as well. Uh, without question, I'm uh, I'm I'm look forward to some type of a similar situation happening here in Calgary and Edmonton um, in the near future with legalization and uh, um, of course where whichever direction they go. Um, hopefully sooner than later. And uh, uh, have you got anything on that front? Obviously, um, with the dispensaries there, you're having problems, like you say. They're looking at moving forward with going with licenses, yet they're still raiding places and doing that type of stuff. I mean, is there is there any kind of consensus or is it enforcement yeah. against political will or? Well, it's a very confusing in Canada right now, as you know, because we're supposedly on the verge of legalization, but. Nothing's happened to change the law yet. Harper's mandatory minimums are still in place and still being enforced. Just read an article about a guy who's looking at six months in jail for growing uh, like uh, 30 plants <coughs> in his own home. Sorry, in his own home. And he's looking at six months in prison, uh, mandatory minimum. And, you know, in Vancouver, we've got dispensaries selling marijuana all over the place, over 100 in the city. There's uh, And there's many more in other cities in British Columbia as well. Victoria's got like 30 or something dispensaries. There's six in a little town called Port Alberni, and many other cities have got them. Uh, but it's such a weird situation right now where Vancouverese are giving out business licenses to dispensaries, but they're still not legal under federal law. And in Vancouver, they, they put together the dispensaries that are incredibly restrictive and will result probably in over half to two thirds of the current dispensaries having to shut down or fight with the city. They not only have to, we have to be away from schools and uh, community centers twice the distance that liquor, but we also have to be 300 meters apart from each other. And so they want to what they call decluster the dispensaries. I don't know what the problem is having two dispensaries close to each other. If the market demands that there you know, be more dispensaries, they'll be there. Uh, but the city says they're not going to raid dispensaries. They're going to use, you know, other other means, fines and 
business licenses and, and the bureaucracy to deal with the, how many dispensaries there are. So it's a very weird situation. You know, in the next year, we're going to see dispensaries <laughs> opening up faster than the rate of one a day. And uh, so we are really overgrowing the government. And and uh, and so, you know, we that's why I think home cultivation is very important to include because it helps act as a price control and keep the price down. If you can grow your own cannabis, the more expensive and legal stuff gets, the more likely you are to bypass that and just grow your own. And, uh, you know, I don't think most Canadians should have to grow their own. They should be able to buy it in a store, but they shouldn't have to pay outrageous prices. And if they want to grow it themselves, they should be able to just like any other plant. I agree. I agree. I mean, yeah, why not? I mean, and, and if they go the, obviously, like you say, more than likely the provincial route, because that's what they do with other products, like you say, alcohol and tobacco. If they go provincially, are they going to sell it through, you know, Alberta is different than in British Columbia, where we have privatized uh, liquor stores where you can purchase liquor. So as a result, we have I don't know, probably five, 10 times more liquor stores in our, you know, per capita than you probably do out there. So it creates a little bit different of a problem in that aspect. Um, if the go through the same type of stores, obviously it seems a lot more, would be a lot more open in Alberta uh, because then, you know, it's in a lot of private hands. Whereas to the other provinces, it's all done uh, through government agencies. Well, you're absolutely right. It's, it would be an irony there that Alberta, which is not a very marijuana-friendly province, if we end up regulating marijuana the same way we do alcohol, Alberta could have one of the most free systems for marijuana in the country. Right. Uh, because other provinces are quite restrictive. Ontario is very restrictive, have a strict government monopoly, very hard to get uh, uh, alcohol in many ways in, in Ontario. Whereas in BC, they just light, loosen things up. We're allowed to have is beer gardens now you can bring your kids into the beer garden with you while you have some drinks and so you know we want to see more cannabis as well really cannabis should be much more readily available than alcohol but we'll settle as available as alcohol to begin with so what's uh, what's in store for dana here in the near future are we gonna we we know you're you've got all these books out uh for those of you that are listening and maybe don't know about dana and his uh his penmanship Maybe you can tell us uh, your wonderful list of books you have available. Sure. Well, I've got a few books out now and more to come, and I'm really actually pushing this publishing thing and starting a publishing company here for books by me and some of my other activist friends. But uh, uh, i got a book out called Harry Pothead and the Marijuana Stone. We just reprinted it for the fourth time. I've been selling this book for about seven years now, and it's a fun parody of Harry Potter with a big marijuana theme to it, and it's got a dozen full-color illustrations, and I'm quite proud of it. It's funny and educational, and I think you can enjoy it. Check out harrypothead.net. That's H-A-I-R-Y, because he's Harry. Uh, and I've also got a book called Green Buds and Hash, which is also a parody. This one is a parody of the Dr. Seuss book, uh, Green Eggs and Ham, and it's beautifully illustrated, uh, very Seussy in style, and... It's a fun little parody with the medical marijuana twist at the end that I also uh, I think people will enjoy. But the book that I've really put the most work into, and that's really, I think, the most meaningful, is called The History of Cannabis in Canada, or Cannabis in Canada, The Illustrated History. And this book I've been working on for over 20 years now, and it's just come out a few months ago. It's oversized. Uh, it's uh, black and white, fully illustrated. Every page is a beautiful piece of art to look at. And it tells the story of cannabis in Canada from 1606 right up till the election of Trudeau in modern times. And uh, I think everybody will learn a lot about the early history of cannabis in Canada. I know I did writing it and what an important role this plant has played in our country's history, uh, how there were doctors and patients using medical cannabis in Canada for 100 years from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. Uh, first Canadian busted for marijuana possession, bought pre-rolled joints at a pharmacy in Vancouver and was charged for that, uh, much like it is now, very confusing times uh, with, in terms of what's legal and what isn't. But the story of how cannabis was important to Canada and how it was banned in Canada with the RCMP, you know, literally burning hemp fields down in the 1930s and threatening farmers, uh, busting pharmacies, taking medical marijuana products out. It's a fascinating story and one that hasn't been told before and which I'm very proud to have able to been put together. And uh, CanadasHistory.ca is where to find that book. And uh, I actually, uh, to help promote it, I sent a free copy of my book, Anagram of Marijuana, 
to every one of Canada's liberal members of parliament. Uh, and it caused quite a kerfuffle, and they all got quite worked up. Some of them thought it was kind of funny, but then they got the word from the headquarters that they couldn't be joking about this, and some of them called the RCMP to take away my gram of marijuana that I'd sent them through the mail, and uh, we got quite a bit of controversy. But uh, hopefully it also encouraged some Canadians to get a copy of my book and learn the history of cannabis in Canada, because that's what it's all about. So those are my three books that I have out right now anyway. they got more coming, but... Uh, those are the big three, and I think even Americans will be interested in reading the history of cannabis in Canada because it's uh, it's got a lot of information that I think will help people understand the story around the world and how these laws came into place and the really important role some Canadians played. You know, people know about Harry Anslinger, the American who, who was the big uh, narc who really brought in a lot of the war on drugs and war on marijuana, but few folks have heard of Colonel Sharman, who was the Canadian, who was Harold Anslinger's soulmate. And this guy uh, was the first head of the UN anti-drug committees. He made sure that all these uh, UN committees were stocked with police officers and cops and not doctors and health officials and uh, was highly influential. He was the guy that came up with conspiracy, uh, the idea that if you conspire to break a drug law, you're just as guilty. And uh, so there's a lot of good stuff in these books, and I, and I hope people will be interested and try to grab a copy by through the mail. We do mail order all around the world and uh, check them out for themselves. Cool, cool, cool. At the end of the show, we'll get you to put in a plug for that where everybody can uh, can get access to it. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, important to get information out to people. You know, in Canada, bongs and pipes and books about growing marijuana are still illegal. These laws are not always that enforced, but, but Canadians Canadians got some terrible laws on the books here still. And, and bizarrely, you know, in a country where there's hundreds of marijuana dispensaries opening and selling cannabis, it's actually still against the law to sell bongs, to sell vaporizers, it's against the law to promote the use of cannabis. It's against the law to sell books about how to grow your own cannabis. It's a very bizarre situation in this country. And, uh, and that's why I say that the marijuana movement in Canada is our biggest civil disobedience movement ever because we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of Canadians now uh, you know, making a living off of civil disobedience and breaking the law openly. And I think it's unprecedented in Canadian history. I would agree that uh, I don't think any law in our history has ever been so blatantly um, basically abused or, or um, not abused, um, ignored by the uh, general public. Yeah, I think it's really wonderful, actually, the kind of people power that we have and that, it, that people are brave enough to get together and to rise up against what they see as an injustice. Uh, it makes me proud to be a Canadian, but it also makes me frustrated that our governments refuse to change these laws uh, after so many years, so many decades, even though Canadians clearly don't want them on the books. People say that Trudeau, that Justin Trudeau was going to legalize, but I always say that Pierre Trudeau, Justin's dad, who was prime minister in the, in the 70s and early, uh, that he was actually the one who's legalized because it's his charter of rights that he put in that has allowed all these court cases that support marijuana to go through. Uh, it's all because of the Charter of Rights that we have, and that was something that Pierre Trudeau brought into Canada. That's how we got medical marijuana. That's how we've we've been able to defy a lot of these laws and, and go after them is because they've been deemed unconstitutional because of the Charter. So it's uh, interesting how Canadian history has played out on this issue. Absolutely, and it was obviously back in 72 when they first started with the Commission and, and recommended that uh, cannabis was would do more harm uh, as in... Um, being made illegal than being legalized. So um, it's a long, long time, commission. Long, yeah, long time in coming. Uh, Seventy two. Well, and then, and, yeah, and then more recently, Canada Senate put out a report in two thousand and five, I think it was, saying they, it was the most comprehensive report ever done, I think, in the world on marijuana, and they recommended it be legalized for sale to everybody over sixteen. They, they thought that the 16 years should be the age limit, and, uh, and yet they're still in Canada. You know, we get all these amazing reports and documents and studies done by the government, and then they ignore their own research and refuse to act on it uh, for generations. It's uh, quite disgusting, really. I agree. I agree, for sure, for sure. But uh, interesting note that uh, at what uh, part the... Trudeau family is going to have in uh, in legalizing cannabis, like you say, as far back as his dad getting things rolling with the Charter of Rights, which is really, really a huge thing. I don't know if 
many Canadians in younger Canadians are aware of um, what happened and uh, and how that came about. It's pretty amazing. And, um, um, you know, here in Alberta, um, I think the only thing that Albertans remember about Pierre Trudeau was his uh, national energy program where um, the yeah, he's not true. Pierre Trudeau is not so popular in Alberta, I guess. But, uh, but uh, you know, there is, yeah, these changes have been happening in Canada for decades and decades. It takes a long time for these things to come to fruition. But uh, I do hope we're going to see legalization actually happening under Justin Trudeau in the next year or two. And if they don't do it, we're just going to do it ourselves by just having so many dispensaries and so many people breaking the law that nobody cares about the law anymore. And I think that's uh, that may end up being how it goes. But what I wanted to mention about the National Energy Program was that it's actually a program that saved the oil industry in, in Alberta. Um, and yes, at the time, it really hurt the economy and 200 American oil rigs were pulled out of here and uh, people were having to sell their homes for a dollar and it was really terrible for a couple of years. But he knew and he he kept oil for Canada and that's what, what happened. Eventually, all the American oil rigs did come back into Canada. But what Elliot, Mr. Trudeau did was uh, was save the energy or save oil for Canada and keep it out of the hands of our neighbors to the south. So really, we're uh, we have to thank him for uh, for that as well. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, hopefully, Canadian. Hopefully, the rest of uh, of uh, the Albertans that are listening, or any Albertans that are listening, um, will realize that he was uh, uh, instrumental in keeping. Uh, Canadian oil in Canadian hands. Well, let's keep Canadian weed in Canadian hands too, hey, and make Ooh. sure that uh, we get to grill it here and it's not all controlled by multinational corporations with some kind of prohibition on regular Canadians getting involved because it looks like that's how the government wants it to go. And we got to stop that from happening and make sure that legalization means that everybody can grow and use and participate in, in a legal market and not only, uh, you know, a half dozen companies. We don't want Monsanto weed being the only option. That's for sure. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in the free market process. I think there's room for everybody. We've talked earlier on earlier shows about similar models where you have micro breweries and you have micro grows. You have the big multinationals where you're big, you're big companies that are mass producing and you have companies that are producing in smaller batches and uh, making more uh, blends or that type of thing. And also uh, the home grown market where people are brewing their own uh, uh, beers or uh, making their own wines. Um, I think there's room for everybody out there. There is room for the big companies who want to have a piece of the pie. There's room for guys who want to, who love to grow and, and want to make a superior product, uh, maybe in smaller quantities. And then well, they're just the home growing guy who wants to do his own thing. Um, I, I think there's room wow. for everybody in a free market. You know, I mean, I agree with that absolutely. But the challenge is that we have in Canada these licensed producers, these two dozen companies who are legally growing marijuana, selling it to patients by mail order. And they've all invested millions and millions, you know, tens of millions of dollars in uh, these sophisticated uh, indoor grow operations with high security to meet all of the standards of the Health Canada requirements, which are really way too strict and severe. But now that they've done that, they're out there saying they want no one else to be able to sell marijuana. They want the government to shut down all these dispensaries. They want to make it difficult for anybody else to get a license like they got a license. And they really want to have a monopoly on marijuana in Canada. And it's worrisome because these guys have got deep pockets and they've got ties to the Liberal Party, or at least one of them does. The biggest company is called Canopy, uh, also called Tweed. Canopy owns Tweed, and Tweed's been buying up several of the other medical marijuana companies. And they're like a half a billion dollar company now. They don't even really sell that much marijuana yet. I'm pretty sure our dispensary probably sells more pot than Tweed does. But they're a half a billion dollar company, and their former CEO, the guy who really founded it, was also the chief financial officer for the Canadian Liberal Party. So these guys are going to want regulations and laws in place that make it difficult for their competition, that make it difficult for you to grow your own, that will shut down dispensaries, and that will let them be the big player. 
And I don't mind, like you're saying, there should be big companies involved. We have no problem with a big company selling cannabis to Canadians, but that can't be the only option, right? It's got to be like beer, where, yeah, there's little bats and the Molsons and the whatever, but there's also hundreds of microbreweries. And you can brew your own beer in your own basement if you want to. And you can go to a U-brew place, and they'll brew it for you with, with your help and that. So there's all these different kinds of options, and we need that for cannabis as well. And it does worry me that, that because that, you know, people want legalization to be a new form of prohibition, but the difference being that it's my guy who's selling everybody marijuana instead of the Hells Angels. But if you try to grow your own, we're going to bust you. And if you try to get your own little company going, we're not going to let you. You know, that's not really legalization. That's just a different form of prohibition and one that I really think we need to strive to avoid. Well, we're down to the last minute or so. This is a good time to give a shout out to favorite URLs. We'll start with our joint guest first, Dana. Well, cannabishistory.ca is where you can find my history book. Uh, Harry Pothead, H A I R Y P O T H E A D dot net gets into the Harry Pothead book. And my website's Dana Larson, L A R S E N dot com. And you can find out more about me there. And uh, yeah, check it all out. And Kelly? Um, for those of you that are uh, didn't hear the first time around, it's Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at kdkwholesale.ca uh, for a free vaporizer uh, to qualified medical patients. And I want to remind people that we are 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week broadcasting network with over 20 hosts dedicated to ending prohibition. All our programming is free to download. Go to the archive pages on the timeforhemp.com website and you'll find every MP3 that's available to be downloaded and shared with your friends. Also, make it a point to check out our apps if you've got smartphones or tablets that you travel around the world with. Uh, you can grab a iHeart app app or an uh, iTunes app or a SoundCloud or a Tumblr or whatever and uh, you'll be able to find Time for Hemp and enjoy us on the go. Well with that said remember the next time you hear me you'll know that it's Time for Hemp. <laughs> Drop King Seeds, we sell the finest marijuana seeds in the world. Grown organically with original genetics, every seed is cultivated for large yields, high THC content, and measured for both CBD and CBN levels. Did we mention we sell more than 20 of the world's best marijuana strains in feminized, auto-flowering, medical, and regular varieties, including White Widow, Blueberry, Purple Kush, Haze Extreme, and so many more. Through our website and friendly call support team, our seeds are available for direct order with speedy worldwide shipping. Crop King Seeds are also sold in over 100 locations worldwide. Excuse me, I'm looking to buy some Crop King Seeds. Look no further, my friend. <laughs> wow, they're here and in so many strains. Buy your seeds now, in-store or online at CropKingSeeds.com. Or call us toll-free at 1-844-CROP-KING. That's 1-844-276-7546.